the Eo. age of... <laughs> is that making you feel... Eo! Make you feel warm and... Yeah, that's great. Warm and badly. That's... Eo! Stuff is stuff is uh... Not out loud, but in my head I'm going like... This is... This is the one. This is gonna be the one. I'm doing this right now. Sacking so yourself up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's like, like, it's like I'm, I'm writing this oh, this one song that I always dreamt about, you know. Uh -huh. And then I would fail. And I'm honest. I'm trying to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, if I Listen, you're a bit shit, so we're going to need to work <laughs> hard on these songs. How honest are you? Yeah, something like that. I'm often standing in the shower for 10 straight minutes just <laughs> crying. What year is this? Who's the Prime Minister? These are all important questions, but it doesn't matter now because it's time for another episode of Charlie Talk, which is still a show where I, the lead singer of indie rock band Charlie Wood, talk to a musician about making music. And talking of things that matter, do you know what matters? Subscribing to this channel and liking this video. Do you know why? I'll tell you. This channel is designed to support the music scene here in Austria. If you're interested in live music and you want to support it, that's what we're doing as well. So please just subscribe. And on this episode, I am speaking to someone who can definitely be described as a guy. David Fuhrer! David, thanks oh, for coming I'm so, in. I'm sorry. Yeah. We don't have to stop. Thanks for having me. <laughs> you're welcome. Thank you for coming in. You're a busy man, so I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule. Well, that sounds like that. Um, it sounds like as if I'm the arrogant one. Yeah. In this one. Okay. Okay. See how I turned the tables there? Yeah, yeah. Well done. It was good. It's a power move. I'm okay, well versed. Yeah, okay. That's, I know. I know. Interview how this is, 101. And I know how this is going. You can okay, see okay, how okay. this is. This is. I'm starting off. I'm getting confrontational. Ready. I'm getting. Oh, it's so warm in here. All yeah, sudden. yeah. That's, okay. that's how it's going to go on. So, um, for seriously. the dum dums who have no idea what masterpieces you have wrought upon the world of music, please tell us what we should be showing the people to get them on the same page. I think. It would be a good idea to either, you can decide later. Okay. That's all right. Yeah. Show Milk Plus doing doing a live gig on Dona Fest 2005. Okay. It's on, it's on YouTube, so okay. you can get this. 40 seconds of that. Or? Or uh, just one of our latest music videos, I guess, Man on Wire or... Mm -hmm. um, I have to remember the, the names of the songs. It's been a while. That's a loud track. All right. One of those is going to happen. Venus Breakdown would be another good idea. Possibly that one. I'll put subtitles on so you know what's happening. Here we go! So there you are. You've seen that now. You know what's up. You're welcome. David, progressive alternative space rock. I'm saying to you, you're nodding. He loves it. Um, how much do you hate regular time signatures? If you could send a message, look into that camera and send a message to all the straight time signatures out there, what, what would you tell them? Yeah, that says it all. If looks could kill. Fuck you, straight time signatures. Uh, it's difficult, difficult music, difficult to play music, but at the same time, you're a melodies guy, you've got your tunes in there. Um, I like it. I've been listening to it all morning to get ready for the interview. I thought you were at school. I'm a fan. Yeah, shh, don't tell my director. She doesn't watch these anyway, it'll be all right. Gonna get, gonna get me in trouble. Um, so yeah, we'll get, we'll get into the minutiae of it uh, soon. 
Was that a word? Maybe. Who cares? Um, you know what I mean. Could you give us a bit of biographical background to, yeah, just put everything in uh, a context? Okay. Um, it started early, obviously, because my whole family are musicians. My mom plays the flute. My biological dad uh, is a guitar player. And my stepfather is a composer. My grandmother was music and English teacher, mm -hmm. I think. I'm not sure. Please forgive me if I'm wrong. She's still with us? She is with us, yeah. And uh, She'll tell you. She'll call you up. I'm going to send her that link. <laughs> um, my uncle is a cellist and uh, also... Um, what do you call it? Director? No. Conductor. Conductor, yes. Uh -huh. Thanks. Um, as well as my stepdad. So there was always music in my family. Uh -huh. That's for certain. It is very far off what I am doing, though, because they are all into classical music or contemporary music. And what I've been growing up with was more pop music, to be honest. And that's where I am working in this genre, more or less, if you put space rock into pop music, which we do now. I think we can. So it sounds like uh, it would have been a bit of a disappointment to the family if you hadn't ended up doing music. No, I don't think so. They were, if we go deep, they were always very, very strict on, on feedback. They were, my mom tried to push me. They, they asked me, I was, I think, six years old, seven years old, if I want to play an instrument. And then she would, she would name instruments. And at some point, it's, she said drums. And I said, yes. So we got me a snare drum. And after two minutes, the neighbors were here. And that was that. There were no more drumming. There was no more drumming. So we moved on. And I had guitar lessons very early. Um, stopped playing guitar as well. At the same time, in the years of six to, let's say, ten, my grandmother forced me to play a lot of instruments that I didn't like, like it's harmonica, right? Oh, yeah. It's a, all great instruments, obviously, uh, but at the time, you, I wasn't into it. Were you already, had you already developed a musical taste by that point? I don't think so, uh -huh. but, um, and this is also very important to me as growing as a musician. Um, my mom, when we drove to my grandmother's place, um, we had a cassette in the car and on one side there was Dire Straits and on the other it was Sting. And so we kept listening to that forever. Uh -huh. Literally for years. Like all the time when we went to Styria, which was a two hour drive, we had like two hours of listening to Sting and Dire Straits. And that's why, for some reason, to Sting, I kind of, if I hear Sting or listen to Sting, it has a similar feel to what I would, I don't want to say father figure, but it's kind of this, like if I... A strong nostalgic it, connection to the somehow, music of Sting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's to his voice. His beautiful voice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, at the age of... Is that making you feel... Eeyo! Make you feel warm and... Yeah, that's great. Warm and deadly. That's... Eeyo! Stop it, stop it. Uh, <laughs> I'm stopping it. Um, I was, I think, seven years old when I said to my mom, I want a, um, a boombox. Like, what, what was it called? Uh, Ghetto a, blast. A stereo, yeah. Oh, okay. Whatever. I, it was a... It was something not for the shoulder, oh, okay. but like similar, you know, uh -huh. and it had two cassette decks, a CD player, and we went home. I was super happy and it took me about two minutes to figure out I didn't have anything to listen to. <laughs> you know, there was like, this is not music itself, you know, <laughs> the music is on tape. I can make super loud noises thing. with this. So what they gave me... <laughs> was a CD of Wolfgang Mutspiel, very early Wolfgang Mutspiel uh -huh. CD. And that was my first introduction to jazz music. Okay. So very early. And from that 
on from that time on i music was definitely a big part of my life well i like knowing your music as i do um staying in dire straits <laughs> on one side of the cassette and the other uh that is a pretty clear indication of where you then went musically with your output like loud guitars and rocking out and shouting and on the other hand uh, you're very rarely doing a straight time signature and there's lots of atonal lines and it's experimental in the style of solo steam but with loud guitars yeah right maybe makes sense to me yeah where I see the background with Sting and, and Dire Straits is is how to how to use music as a language, how to tell a story, mm -hmm. how to to tell a song, mm -hmm. not write a song, but like really tell what's a song, and um, you know there's there's certain elements to the melodies in the vocal lines and everything that's very very on point. And um, I'm sure that like burnt itself some some somewhere deep inside me, mm -hmm. um, because I always had it um, easy time. I would say to to write music that is approachable mm -hmm. for people. Um, probably also a reason why I got bored with it and then went into music that is not so approachable. Okay, so let's get into your approachable phase. When did you start writing music? that was approachable. Your first tunes were all okay. Um, pop hits. <laughs> no, pop not, not at all, not at all. I was, I was failing for many years, mm -hmm. to be honest. I was failing for many years. And at some point, I was 15 years old, a friend of mine said, hey, you play guitar, right? I said, yeah, I, I mean, I knew, I knew about 10 chords at the time, so... I said yes. Girls will let you kiss them if you know 10 chords when you're 15. Absolutely. Am I right? You are. <laughs> um, so he said, he asked me if I would like to join his band and I said sure. And we had this one song, it, called, it was called Lucky Streikt. And it was a very simple song. I loved it. They, liked, they loved it, I guess. It's, I didn't write it. Um, but I got into playing all of a sudden it was not m any teacher or any grown-up telling you or asking you if you want to do it it was more kind of this it happened by itself and I didn't stop playing anymore and I wrote songs I I recorded my first solo album the same year and um, so how were you there 15 yeah uh -huh. but that that never got out or anything and it's better like, if there's any copies left, I have to certainly destroy them. Granny, granny. Yeah, she knows those. <laughs> she knows those. Um, so, back to your question. I failed many years, uh -huh. many times. And um, I had to learn it the hard way. And But I was just... Music helped me through a lot of depressions when I was young. So, my connection to music was so strong that... Um, I don't know, it's, it was the language or the place where I was, I thought someone would understand how I feel. Uh -huh. You know, teenage yeah. boy, unhappy, mm -hmm. hating school, mm -hmm. hating being told what to do, kind of um, walking on the donor canal up and down instead of going to school and listen to music. That's what I did. Mm -hmm. So the connection was there. To music all the years. So you finished school? No, I didn't. You dropped out. I dropped out. Uh, I dropped out many times. Uh -huh. um, but then at the la the very last time I dropped out was even like half a year before Matura. Okay. And I said no, I'm I'm not doing this anymore. Uh -huh. But that at that time I found out that for studying music you didn't need to finish school. So I was like, hey, I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, latest dudes. Exactly. And then you studied music. I studied jazz guitar. Yeah. Right on. Which I also didn't finish. <laughs> <laughs> Too much people telling you what to do in that as well, or what? It, it got boring at some point. Uh huh. I think there's a big in, 
a big um, difference between whether you're saying something through an instrument or you're trying to say something and the instrument and the music and the music theory and all those things are kind of getting telling in the way. sorry getting in the way getting in the way and right. telling you how it's how how to say it you know yes. or let me put it this way um christian Mouchpil, and in his cv he said um blah 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 years this to that he said um musikstudium rechtzeitig abgebrochen <laughs> and that that says it all that's uh, your philosophy on that it kind of helped me at the mm -hmm. time i'm not saying that it's wrong to finish your study yeah. or anything it, not at all but it was it was a good approach for me and myself becoming a musician yeah. mm -hmm. the musician that you now are like the musician that you were meant to be i would say like maybe yeah, it sounds like maybe it sounds like that would have yeah, would have strongly affected uh, your musical direction. Maybe if you'd stayed, maybe you you felt that, huh? That it was absolutely taking you in a direction that you weren't meant to go in. Absolutely, you feel like absolutely. you were supposed to go in. Mm -hmm. It was actually at a time where I kind of knew how to play guitar, knew how to do a solo, and all these kind of things because of music theory mm -hmm. and because of technique that I learned. When I was listening, at this time, I was listening to an old recording of the live Milk Plus show and I played a solo and I was like, holy shit, what am I, what's happening? What is this? This is so cool. And back at the time, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh -huh. I was just doing it because I don't know why. Uh -huh. It just happened. And it showed me that the approach of something that sounds good is not based in theory and technique. Mm -hmm. It helps. Like in a language when you do, when you know vocabulary. Sure. It helps you to say something with an instrument, mm -hmm. but it's, it's not the, the main thing. It's not the, the, the only way to, to say something. Yes. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It's, um, it's like in poetry, like, yes, you can break it down into syntax and, and grammar, but the beauty of it lies in the human expression behind it. I mean, I'm aware, as I say this, that I say this sentence a lot in these interviews, but true good music, like true music, has to be the expression, in my opinion, the expression of the human condition made into sound. And if you, like you said, if you've got a load of music theory, uh, constructs, all the clever stuff that you've learned how to do in a, in a course, if that starts to get in the way of the purest of musical expression, then it's holding you back, like it's stopping you from. And another thing that I've noticed about music study is uh, it makes people worry about making mistakes too much. Mm -hmm. They're terrified of it. Mm -hmm. Like human beings in general in the world in, at large are terrified of making mistakes. It, it's, it's, it's a plague on the modern world, like yeah. the, the, everywhere. It's just a terrible, terrible thing. Um, but in art, it, it cripples you. It's absolutely, uh, yeah, it just holds you back completely from um, freely expressing art, like whatever art you're into doing. A fear of failure, fear of making a mistake, it's going to stop you from doing it properly. And I'm always going on, like, these interviews, we always come down to that. Yeah. Like, nearly every single interview. I, I get people it. express that. And, and that's a major disadvantage of studying an instrument and I had to unlearn that. It took mm -hmm. me a long time to unlearn um, the fear of making a mistake. Yeah. And like you said, that solo that you did where you watched it years later and were like, what is even happening yeah. there? You tapped into like what music should be about, which is just saying it. Like you're showing something real. For me, like, like that's what true music is. You're showing something real. And yeah, you can use theory to help you get there. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people get lost on the way, and yeah, rechtzeitig abgebrochen. That says it uh, stopped his studies in time. That is what is what the translation of that is. Uh, that really says it. It can you run the risk of disappearing into mm -hmm. the maths.
Yeah. 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 It's tricky. It is tricky. It's a delicate, it's a delicate balance. Exactly. You need to find a balance. Yeah. Paul McCartney, I think, famously refused to ever learn even to read music. Oh, yeah. He, He absolutely said he's frightened that it will get in the way. Like mm-hmm. exactly what uh, Maud said, like same thing. Yeah. So he deliberately never, can't even read music, didn't even learn that. Do you happen to have any drinks here? Uh, yes, I yeah. can do you a cocktail of my own creation. Mm-hmm. It's called Mother's in Law, Mother in Law's Opinion. I have one of these. Make it so. All right, so um, that brings us then to the creation of Milk Plus. as the thing that you are best known for musically, I would say. The motivation was, at that time, it was just to, to make music. And uh, a good friend of mine, the first drama of, drama of Milk Plus, uh, Christoph Reiner, um, he came back from the United States. He was there for one year and he said, oh yeah, by the way, I'm drumming now. And I said, well, that's good because I'm writing songs. And then we had our third friend in the group because we were always like this kind of, you know, this tricycle. Um, And he played piano. So our band was being formed. Was Uh that a sentence? Yeah. Is that correct English? Yeah. Okay. Um, We just wrote songs. It was kind of a mixture between Nirvana and Radiohead, maybe... Pink Floyd was a good, big influence, um, but it was pretty straight on rock. No, not straight. I mean, you know, Nada Surf, the early stuff of Nada Surf, that was a big influence. Mm-hmm. Like, just make music, make songs, write songs. Muse, Muse come along. They came out like 2001 or something like that, 2000, until one day when there was a new band on this planet called the Mars Volta and that somehow blew all our three minds at the same time. We didn't know what it was because it was more, it was heavier than what we used to listen to and we, we didn't know exactly why we loved it so much. But there was something about it. There was something about being out of the ordinary, being, yeah, there was something about saying something with an, a certainty that nobody else used. And it kind of reminded me of, of being younger when I was a teenager and was kind of this introverted, um, somehow depressed teenager that was just trying to make sense out of all this, you know? There was this band using a language that I've never heard before, and it somehow got to me. Mm-hmm. And it was different. That's the most important thing. It was different than what other people do, what other bands do, what other people say. It's, it's something that goes across everything, you know, not uh-huh. just music. That can, it, just... it was like a, a, a philosophy, a musical philosophy that, Thanks that, that for putting it this way. took root in every aspect yes. of the music. Uh-huh. And this was a huge influence, and all of a sudden we wanted to make music like that. And this, to be honest, Milk Plus is just a ripoff. <laughs> it's a Mal, Mal Volta too. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> if, 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 this, if I had to put it into one sentence, yeah. then this is it. Um, obviously, you, you then learn to, to find your own way of saying something, and, and it's different. We, Yes, unavoidably, like of one. course, yeah. yeah. Copyright laws alone stop that from happening. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> um, but yeah, that's the story of how Milk Plus was born. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Discography. I'm going to go, I'm going to just throw them up on the screen and you just go album one. So, album one. Of Milk Plus, yeah. sorry, um, Zeropolis. Next one. Who was Mr. Feldman? Next one. Band on Wire. That's what we got, right? Another one? Well, it's it's about to come out, Ooh. I guess. I'm going to put a big old question mark here. It's called Oyasumi Maybe. 
Oh, yeah, so me, maybe. Oh, yeah, so me, maybe. Okay. Sounds Japanese, or a sentence without punctuation or spaces. It is absolutely a Japanese word. Aha! And an English word. Oh, yeah, so me, maybe. Gotcha. Not one word. No, two words. Okay. Japanese word means? Good night. Hmm. Cool. Ah, you've been cooking up another Milk Plus album. Yes. Awesome. Too, for too long. Bloody hell, did you find time to do that? I didn't. It was, we recorded more than a year ago. Ah, I see. And I didn't have fun. I didn't find time to finish it. Yeah, sure. Since then. Yeah, I know. It should, it's, it's a shame. It really is. It, but there's, I think there's going to be an end to it. And we will, we should release it this year. I, cool. I hope. Milkplus.com? I'm not sure. I don't think we, we do homepages. No homepages. No. But you've got a Facebook page. Oh, we do have a Facebook There's page. There's a Facebook page. No, plus music. Music. So get that followed. You're an Instagram guy? Milk I plus. do have Instagram. Milk plus is on Instagram. Milk plus is on Instagram. But it's like my, la my last post is also more than a year ago. So. <laughs> but we can assume that when the album's ready, you're going to post it on there. So um, for people who want true. to be informed... Can we follow you on Spotify or something like that? You gonna put it's, it on there? <laughs> Milk Plus is too hard to find on Spotify. It's bloody impossible. I have it to is. scroll for ages. Yeah, because of the stupid plus sign. Yeah. We came up with that name before, not before internet, but before all these search engines. Engines and algorithms yeah. have kicked in. Yeah. I was like, how come this is taking so no, long? No, it's, I was it's on a stupid plus sign. Took me so forever. It only takes milk as a... Yeah. There's a band called Milk. There's probably a million bands called Milk. With Milk in the name, and all of them come before you. <laughs> Any band or song or album with the word Milk in the name comes before you. Yeah, I, I got the message. Oh, thanks. <laughs> it's a terrible name. <laughs> no, it's a nice name. No, it's... But uh, from an algorithm perspective, no, it's useless. Oof. Cool. So later this year, Milk Plus album coming out. Get that followed in one of those places. Links. In the description, uh, yeah, and then be informed when that is done. Delicious. Delicious. Anyway, there's another one coming. Okay, we're still on Milk Plus, good. So, what I always want to know, one of my favorite questions is, please describe a typical Milk Plus songwriting procedure. A typical, doesn't have to be the one, but a typical okay. songwriting okay. procedure. That would be me. Right. Setting at the computer, the guitar on my lap, talking to myself, maybe not out loud, but in my head, I'm going like, this is, this is the one, this is going to be the one. I'm doing this right now. Sucking yourself up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This in like, I just, I'm, I'm writing this, oh, this one song that I always dreamt about, you know. Uh -huh. And then I would fail. <laughs> then I would fail. <laughs> that's a typical. And that's, 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 that's how a typical mm -hmm. Milk Plus right. song is born. Cool, cool, cool. And I would fail. And then I would try again and fail again and try again and fail again. And then at some point when I lost all the motivation, I would just sit there and do something on the computer, probably scrolling down Facebook or what, you know whatever it is, and just tapping on the board, uh -huh. on the finger, what is it? The fingerboard? Fingerboard, yeah. yeah. And all of a sudden there's some rhythm to it or whatever, or some tonal mel melody, I don't know. Something that all of a sudden hooks me and from that moment on it goes by itself. And it's the song is then finished within minutes. You find a melody real quick and I sing along in gibberish and um, record it real quick and listen to it and I know what needs to happen next. Mm -hmm. That would be the the most typical way of songwriting for me. Yep. Yeah. Failing until there's no motivation left. Mm -hmm. I do exactly the same thing, almost identically, except I very rarely sit down and try and write a song. But the rest of it from that point onwards, I just wait. Yeah. I do something else, and then the song goes. 
There it is. Oh, yeah, there it is. <laughs> some and then I seat. record. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Normally walking no. or moving or cycling or something. Yeah, and then shower. Shower is a yes. good place to, to write. In music. the toilet, also in the shower. Yes. Yeah. There. It, I'm often standing in the shower for ten straight minutes, just <laughs> crying. No, just staring into That's space. A, and, right. <laughs> it's a good place to cry. It's warm. It's a warm place to cry. It's good. More, more top life tips. <laughs> Um, yeah, and and like you said, like I record the first bit quickly with gibberish, identical. Really? Yeah. You this one. It's, gibberish. It's because it's not my mother tongue, English. Oh, right. But I thought... No, and... I don't want to get... I don't want the words getting in the way. Okay. So sometimes That's there the... will be a word that I like the feel of. Yeah. But I work... I work in... Um, I work in how the words feel, primarily, because of how I look at music, because, you know, like what I said earlier, it has to be a direct expression of the human condition. And if I worry about what the words mean mm. first, then that will get in the way of mm. doing that. So what I worry about is how the words feel in my mouth and as I'm saying them, mm. how they make me feel. Uh, and that gibberish, exactly, the rhythm of the it rhythm. is very important mm. to me. So rhythm, melody in gibberish, with gibberish syllables, and then I fill in, I've got to find the words because they have to. Mm. I once said to the time. band, "Guys, can't I just, can I just use gibberish? Like, is, does it have to be words?" And they're like, "No, you definitely got to use real words, Andy." I was like, "Do I really know? Can I not just do a load of nonsense?" And that's like a real pure expression. And they went, "No, we're not comfortable with that. You've got to come up with words." So then I had to sit down for literally three solid days to find the words that fit that rhythm, that felt correct when I part. said them, because I didn't want to add syllables. That's a hard part. I, I refused. Know that. Yeah, but it's very, very similar. Yeah. gibberish at the beginning. There's a fun story to that um, because I <laughs> we even played songs live, and I would just sing gibberish still uh -huh. because there were no lyrics yet, and there were only parts maybe. So we we had that, and I was would just sing gibberish. Uh, and at some point, we played at one of these clubs, Chelsea, I think. Whatever, it doesn't matter. And we played at least four songs where I didn't have any lyrics for you. Mm -hmm. And after this, after the show, um, a British girl came up to me and said, I love the poetry in your songs. I said, thank you very much. That I didn't tell her that. No, no. There was but no. she got it. Like she, got she, it. she understood she, what she you understood, were saying. She understood something. Yeah. She understood That's what, I mean. what she needed That's to exactly understand. That's exactly what I mean. Yeah. Words can sometimes get in the way of expression. Like, she totally got it. And that just shows, you know, they should never be, in my opinion, they should never be the primary, like what exactly the words are, should not be the primary concern, in my opinion. Because that's not what it's about. That that story shows that brilliantly. I like that story a lot. Yeah. It's a true story. True story. True stories with David Thurler. The reason that I was surprised to hear that you have been cooking up a Milk Plus album on the side is because I know that you are ludicrously busy these days with your recording studio. Is it still called Aurora? It is. Aurora Studios. Aurora Studios. Link in the description. Um, and you are producing and recording other people's records. That's true. A lot. Really a lot. Some. Come on. Discography. Bam, bam, no, bam, no, no, bam, bam. Is that too many bams already? It, no, no, no. There's plenty bam, of more room. Bam. I, I, I keep forgetting, you know. Bam. Jollywood. It's going well, on. Well, I, I didn't produce you guys. I, I you did a little bit of producing. Yeah. And you didn't feel comfortable. Well, with then the you term. don't know what producing is. <laughs> well, that's the thing. You didn't feel comfortable with the term producing, but you added some noises to the song. Okay, yeah. And well, there, that is yeah. a, I think an aspect of production. In, yes. It is. You're right. And uh, there's going to be a lot of people disagreeing with what I'm about to say. But good. Controversial I think opinions the, the job of a mixer is to go. enhance the song. Yes. And if effects enhance a song, then it is just. May, it might be the job of a mixer, of a mixing engineer to put in effects or add something where it would help a song could be a tambourine, could be a shaker. And I know that a lot of people disagree because I've been talking to a lot of people about this. But that's my opinion. I'm just trying to help a song or like a story being delivered. Okay, so 
There are people who believe that a mixing engineer should not take any sort of no. musical. Yes, I mean the sound input. There's, there's, they should not add exactly. sounds. They should even not effects. Add, of course, effects. Like, right. Yeah, but Delay I mean, reasons. I often add effects that are taking the lead. <laughs> right. Right. That, that happens. Weird noises. Weird that noises. Draw attention to themselves. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. But we're getting ahead of ourselves because okay, there will be some people who are not really sure. In fact, a lot of people, when I ask them, don't really know exactly what a producer does in music. Straws are gone. Yeah, I need straws. They're just getting I'm, I'm honestly against straws these days. Yes. Like. Fuck you, straws. <laughs> Good. Express, expressing strong opinions. So. People are not actually entirely sure in music what a, what a producer does. So can you succinctly put us in the picture? Well, um, also in music industry, people are not sure what pro a producer is really doing. Uh -huh. there's so there's too many versions of a producer. Um, so it it varies. That's that's the short answer. If you want to cut now, I don't move on. <laughs> it varies. No, I'm genuinely interested in a slightly longer answer. Okay. Well, if a band is approaching me and asking for help, let's say, um, we always start discussing whether or not I'm going to be producing or, or not, whether there's time, whether there's interest, whether there's money. Um, and if it happens that I would produce an album, then it often starts in a rehearsal room, um, like this one. In a room much yeah. like this, much like this. They all have these nice light bulbs now. Yes. We thought we were being so clever when we yeah. got our nice light bulbs. That's so 2010. Ugh, guys. <laughs> um, no, seriously, um, it starts in a rehearsal room uh -huh. and we would work on the songs. I would give my input. Um, and there's always this thin line of how far can I go? How far can I... Further, first of all, push how push those people into being better musicians as they might. Um, sometimes I go too far. Sometimes I ask someone um, to play this and they can't do it. And then I realize, okay, how far can I go? Um, or sometimes I would suggest something where they might not feel comfortable because it's too much in songwriting. So there's always this finding this line of how far do you want me to be involved? Mm -hmm. um, Which varies from artist to artist. It so varies if there's artist. an artist who sees their songs as their babies, there's a very clear boundary mm -hmm. which they're not prepared to let you cross at all. Yes. And people who have a more pragmatic songwriting approach, this is, you know, it's a, it's a group effort and we're just trying to write the best song that we can write, then you can go in up to your elbows in those kinds of songs. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. It usually happens if I produce that I'm involved very, very deeply. Let's cut to a clip of someone calling you a genius. He's a nice man and it, mm, kind of a genius also for me. So you, you come to the rehearsal room and you look at how far the songs are developed and then depending on what stage they're at, you and the type of songwriter or artist you're dealing with, which you have to very quickly get a feel for, right? Or do you just straight up ask them, what am I allowed usually, to do? Um, usually I'm asking. Yeah. Usually How I'm far asking. am I allowed to go? Yeah. What's cheeky? And I'm honest. I'm trying to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, if I... Listen, you're a bit shit, so we're going to need to work hard on these songs. How honest are you? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> something like that. You guys suck, so we're really going to have to put a lot of work I'm going to cause a musician to it. <laughs> I'm going to get some session <laughs> musicians and overdub all of that. Um, no, but there's, I'm trying to be honest, if, if, if the message doesn't come across, then either I'm the wrong person to do it or right. they listen. Right. And trust. Uh huh. Yes. Cause I said to you, do whatever you want and I'll tell you if I hate it. Mm -hmm. That was, that was our conversation. Uh, I don't think there was only one thing that I recall saying, oh no, take that off again, please. But the rest of it... It's probably that lead guitar solo in <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> yes. That lead guitar solo you put all over the whole song. Two minutes solo. Yeah. Yeah, it was a bit much. Sorry bit for much. that. Yeah. And your harmonica outro for that song was also a bit weird. 
You didn't put that on the album? It didn't make the cut, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's on the cutting room floor. Right. Maybe we'll put that on a B-side sometime. Yeah. <laughs> the version with your harmonica solo, your epic harmonica solo. So, um, it was epic. No doubt. So you get to... Um, a basement. Yeah. Um, and at some point we say, okay, this is, this is good. Let's mm -hmm. go to and record this. Mm -hmm. And then we do that. And then also it happens that I'm, I might not mix it. Mm -hmm. Maybe they want someone else to mix it, or maybe I'm too involved into the, the whole process that I would say I'm, um, I think someone else should mix it. Mm -hmm. if, depending. Or as a friend would say, depende. Depende. Um, and then once the basic song is there, you will often also as a producer, you'll add extra noises, right? Often. Often. Well, that all... You use, yes, often. Because there's some hidden organ on the Charlie Wood album. See if you can hear it. You'll need some very good headphones. Did I do that? See, I, I don't remind that. Yeah, I don't you put that. some organ on there. I usually do. There's some David backing vocals on some of the tracks, <laughs> which I couldn't hear the first few listens until someone else pointed them out to me. They were seamlessly integrated. Yeah, sorry about that. I would have told you if it had upset me, to be honest with you. I didn't notice the first time I listened to it. It's like, what did you think of David's backing vocals? I was like... The what? <laughs> Wait, where? What? On the chorus? Bro. I didn't pay for that. Wait a minute. <laughs> no, no, it's it's fine. So, um, that's something else a producer can do. Yes. Is adding extra noises. But, like I said, there's many people who will probably not do that. And for me, it's producing is something about telling a story. It's always, a song should tell a story, whether it's, approachable or not it's it's always some some story and there's always a vision that you have to create to most of the times together with the band it's cool to have this vision of of something or you have it for yourself that's it's also okay and it's not about ego that's the most important thing there should not be an ego if i put in things and they don't like it it's fine um but what i'm trying to do is help to tell the story, that's all. And if I think that there should be a tambourine or this noise or whatever it is, or it should be wider and then I add some layers of guitars, it happens, then it's only because I think it's easier to understand the story and mm -hmm. not because you want to be playing a guitar on the record. <laughs> <laughs> do bands ever do something and you think they're making a terrible mistake and you cannot persuade them all the time otherwise you think it's just ruining the whole thing <laughs> that must be tough though to like swallow that because at the end of the day you can tell them that you think it's a terrible idea yes. but the final decision is not yours no it's not it must be tough to see especially if you're really into a song like i imagine if there's a song that i think is wicked and i'm working yeah. it with someone and it's not my song and they do something that i think just makes it awful just ruins it completely I've got to sit back and like just let sure. it happen. Swallow it. Must be difficult sometimes. It happens all the time. Oof. Yeah. There's also other ways of being a producer. For example, if you're an executive producer, um, I know producers who pay for everything. They ah, they pay for the studio. They they even pay for a hotel or something for the band. Okay. But then have the last word on everything. Okay. Not uh, gonna name names. So they then take a cut of the record executive yeah. producers. Oh, yes. Right. So they don't make one. They don't just I'm get sure. paid. They no no no. They take they a pay. percentage. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But still, it still exists this way. Yeah, because yeah, that's old school, right? That yeah, was pretty much most of the time how it would happen back in the day. Yeah. yeah. Here's the money. I don't like this. Right. Yeah. And these days, most people are paying a producer like. Uh, I don't know, contract yeah, or some to, description. To have some, uh, like an outside um, listener. Yes. Like someone they trust. That's the most important thing. If they don't trust the producer, then there's no reason to have a producer. So are there any projects that you've been working on uh, recently that you'd like to give a particular shout out to? Or can you not show favoritism? Would it be unprofessional? But is there anything you're particularly excited? Something that's just come out or is about to come out that you want to mention? Because Milk Plus is later this year. Um, 
there's a band called Gospel Dating Service. Mm -hmm. and we've been working on on an album for quite a while now. Totally different. This time, totally different approach to producing. Christoph we, mentioned that it was going to be different yeah, when he came on. Yeah. We actually sat down in the studio and wrote songs together. Uh -huh. And they had some from the rehearsal room. We, we did the rehearsal room thing. We worked at the studio. It, it was just bits and pieces everywhere. Totally different. Also very um, time consu consuming because it was a new approach. Um, but this album is going to be released this year, certainly, um, I think in June. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would recommend it. I think it's, it's going to be beautiful. Beautiful record. I think so. Mentioning this one, it's... It wouldn't be fair to not mention others. Uh, yeah, that's why but, I was like, maybe you don't yeah. want to when, As I was asking, I was like, oh, maybe that's putting him on the spot. He can't really do that. Mm. Because, of course, you're but, not going to... But I, will, I would mention this one because there's also a lot of work from myself uh, in it. So okay. Maybe you did a lot of yeah. co-writing. Yeah. There's going to be an, uh, an, a record coming out from the band called Alpine Dweller. Mm -hmm. My sister is playing cello on this one. Whoa. And... Uh, it's a nice one. It's beautiful. It's it's. I always say it's kind of a Nordic folk acoustic Ooh, thing. Okay. And uh, beautiful, beautiful arrangements. Beautiful songs. Links. No drums. In the description. I'm gonna put no drums on as well. <laughs> Links. No drums. In, in the, the description. description. Uh, okay. Good. So plugs for that downstairs. And of course. New album of Tenta, Weird Subtopia. Weird Subtopia? Or something like that? Something <laughs> like Weird Subtopia. I think it's Weird Tenta are coming on here soon. So watch this space, Tenta coming soon, and they will talk more about that album before it comes out, right? Absolutely. When's it coming out, you know, roughly? March, end of March? Yeah, yeah. you know it better than I, I think. It, I think you said end of March, 30-something. Is it? How many days are there in March? I think plenty. Calendar help with David Fuller. Plenty of days. There's enough days in March. Enough. You can get More a lot enough. of done in March. You get a lot, a lot of done. You get a lot of done. Ed. You get a lot of done in it. I'm sorry. It's all right. I'm sorry, words. I'm sorry, English people. I'm sorry for everything. All right, let's jump back to um, your approach to live performance. How much do you have the live experience in mind during the creating process, for example? Is it is it something that you do for yourself to, to like, you know, this is what I think this song should be and who gives a fuck what the audience thinks about it? Like how much of each consideration mm -hmm. percentage wise goes into? Yeah. Typically, obviously it changes, but. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um. It changed throughout the years, that's for sure. Uh, I was more kind of a, I don't give a fuck what every, anyone. I thought you might say that. Thanks. Yeah. Um, it started, it definitely started like that. And uh, even in interviews, we tried to be as weird as possible. And uh, there were some weird ones out there. Um, but it changed throughout the years because at some point, it's not that I that I'm smarter now. I mean, everybody should find their own way of of, of doing their own things. Uh, there's no rule. There's no that's better or, or worse. Everything's everything is unarguably. <laughs> um, but I, for myself, tried to make it. Uh, if I put it simply, it's, it's, I try to make it more approachable because at the end of the day, it's what I enjoyed most is to play live. And there, there's always a... Um, it's always good to have a good response. It, it just feels good. There's no doubt about it. But there, <laughs> there is no certain rule to... It is this way. It is that way. There's there's so many buts and ifs and absolutely. It's, I know it's, it's a very it's difficult a, it's question, a tricky to question answer, but I'm just interested um, in people's thoughts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think 
or this is this is a good sentence. This is what I've always been saying to other people as well. Is I'd rather be the favorite band of ten people than be a cool band of a thousand people. Mm -hmm. And I think this should tell, if anything, then uh, do your own thing, be extreme about it, and say what you want to say. Mm -hmm. So through your long history of live performance experiences, is there anything that you could share with us that particularly sticks in your mind that's appropriate for telling on a YouTube show? There's not many things you can't say on YouTube, to be honest. No, 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 it is, <laughs> it is just, it is, I do have a story, a, a very stupid story. Um, we played in the middle of, I'm, I'll make it short, and I'll okay. even talk fast, okay? Okay. We played in the middle of nowhere, which is means within Austria. <laughs> uh -huh. We played in the middle of nowhere. Deep I don't, Austria somewhere. I don't even know where. Okay. And it was one of these shows earlier in the career where you play in front of maybe four or seven people, you don't know, you know? And we played, and like the area, there were... There was not even, like this small village, there was not anybody who, why would anybody show up, you know? Not fans of it, loud music. Yeah. Uh -huh. So it was like a disco. There's this term called Dorf Disco. I, I don't want to step on anyone's shoes. Yeah. I don't, I don't, you know. There's, Say there's... no more. We all okay. got a picture in our mind if we've been to the Austrian countryside. All right. Okay. So we played there. There was like five people. I don't know. I don't even remember. Uh -huh. And we're in the middle of our set. And then there's people coming in. And since nothing's really happening at this place, I see them coming in. And I go, like, oh, I think to myself while I'm seeing it, oh, cool. Yeah, it's like four more people. That doubles the audience already. Yes. And this guy, I see the, the way they walk. They were already, they, they had a few drinks too much or something. So he would, for some reason, come straight at the stage that wasn't really a stage but never mind and come straight at me without stopping and I, I'm still playing that song and singing and I'm looking at him and he comes straight up to me starts talking to me while I'm singing and I'm you know I, I didn't know what it is it could be an, it could be something happened outside you know maybe a car accident or something you know and I should shout out is there a doctor in the audience uh -huh. or something who, who knows right sure, right so I go like what's what's up you know they kind of play still and they look at me and and he goes like yeah can can I can I just simply can I ask the DJ to play a song real quick <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I was so perplexed, you know, I was like, I what, was like, what, what, what's happening? what is happening? <laughs> Where am I? That I, that I turned to my band and said, and, and kind of brought the question to them saying, <laughs> hey, is it okay if he How asked for a song from the DJ? And they were like, no, what the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck are you thinking? Um, so I turned back to him saying, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> and tried to get it back into the song which was not you. yeah yeah must have it was you. pretty one of these down that's where you're at a low where you think is this really what i want to do in my <laughs> life you know <laughs> this is yeah. part, part of the job it's a disaster yeah good while well, you're getting your face around that cocktail mm -hmm. it's one delicious. one last thing uh to ask you um to answer that, there is no right or wrong. That's it, everything I said. That's not a rule. That's not my life principle. There is no certainty. There's plenty of ways to get to what you want to say. No music. Everything that David said is the only truth. It's an absolute truth what he's been saying. So please have a heated argument about this in the in the comments. It's true. You can look it up. It's true. It's true what I said. It's true. It's all inarguable fact. And if you disagree, you're wrong. That's how the world works these days. Mm. You're right. Confidently stating opinions as fact. That's the way forward. I'm telling you. Uh, you're right. No grey. We're doing. We're not doing grey anymore. We're doing black and oh, we're doing white. white. Grey's out. Fuck. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. It's a good jacket though. 
Um, okay, this is something that I know you're going to want to clear up because there's a lot of rumors going around about you, David. So once and for all, into your microphone. Which one is that? Are you pregnant? <laughs> Categorically, let's get it cleared up now. Categorically, is the Pregnant, yes or no? Don't beat around the bush, come on. Just answer the question. This is my new interview technique, I'm being tough. Okay, yeah, yeah, I get it. Um, the rumors are oh. out there mm -hmm. and uh, they're trying to think around. You heard it here first. World exclusive, David's pregnant. There we go, moving on. Um, I have a lot of albums coming out, if that's what you meant. Pregnant, creatively. We'll leave it up to you to decide, whatever you think. However you want to interpret that answer, speculation continues. Just keep people talking. Um, yes, in your career, you've done a lot of stuff. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. I would imagine that you have learned some stuff over the years. Is there any advice for young musicians that you would care to pass on that you think might be useful? Do that, don't do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it's interesting because you asked or you said you've done a lot of things in your career. Some worked and some didn't. I'm assuming. Yeah. I think that's, that's, that's a good point. Um, they all worked. Ah. It's, it's not about whether or not... They had an get, effect. Does it get airplay? No, yes. it's, it's, everything works. It's just... Oh, not necessarily whether, musically. It could be like a marketing idea or... Yeah, but, idea but that's okay. This is going to be philosophical. Maybe, okay, but everything probably. works because uh -huh. if you, after you've done something and you think, okay, this didn't work, then it worked to tell you that it didn't work. Aha. Uh -huh. So there is, that's what I meant before. It's like, there's no right or wrongs. There's, you just do and you make mistakes and you call them mistakes. They're probably not mistakes. And then you move on and, and you, you pinpoint it down to where you want to go because out of the experience and out of the mistakes, um, you get to know your better, you get to know yourself better and you, you understand what you want to say and what you have to say. And I think if there's don't do that and don't do this, I think don't measure success or or if something works or not, um, whether or not it gets airplay or a thousand likes or clicks or whatever. It's, it's all important. Everything that is out there is important. Do at some point. not put your feelings of self-worth and success in the hands of others, perhaps, to summarize. Just ask. I should ask you and you say. <laughs> I just listen to what you say and just... Yeah, narrowed it down. Brought it together. Yes, exactly that. David, that's another grey answer. People don't like, don't like that. They want black. It's an excellent answer. I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's another, it's another grey one, guys. It's a, it's, Everything's grey, but it that's is. complicated. We don't, we're not enjoying complicated in 2019. We want simple, quick, easy answers that we can feel strong emotions about quickly. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm sure I have plenty, but I would have to think about it. No, this. but you're right. The truth is always some shade of grey. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's hardly ever black or white. I'm just being silly now because I'm upset by the fact that the world is yeah, what but it I, is at the but moment. But th there's, there's millions of things that I would like to, to say to people that start making music or yes. this, that, that are in a band. It's, it's, yeah, there's always, you always have a wish for the music scene or something, you know? Yes. For example. Oh yeah, come on then, answer that question. What would you like the music scene in Austria to do? There you go, that's, a, that's an interesting question. What's your dream vision for the Austrian music scene? If there's a thing that could happen... That people would dare more. Mm -hmm. And that's the answer, cool. to be honest. It's a good answer. Yeah. Your shortest answer, I think, yeah. of the interview. Yeah, people dare more. Yeah. In life as well. I'd like that. I think the world would be a better place. Yeah. People should dare more. Fail more, obviously, mm -hmm. as, a, as a consequence. But yeah, I would enjoy that as well. Good. All right, that's it for another episode. David, thank you very much for coming in. Thanks for having me. It's been super interesting. Um, do not look at David's homepage, yeah. for the love of God. 
don't go to the Milk Plus homepage, just stay away. I'll put the links to everything else down there. Um, check it out. Follow all the things that need to be followed so you're kept informed. Um, Aurora Studios is always publicizing the works, connected bands that are connected, right? You say, I worked on this album. Yeah, we had a team out. Of, of, of your public relations yeah, team, exactly. mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. your social media people. Exactly. So and they're, and they're all us. over that. So yeah, interesting stuff happening over there. Uh, make sure you follow that and keep yourselves informed. And I will see you on the next episode of Charlie Talk. Bye-bye.